Sudan's Omar al-Bashir is ousted as president by the military, following months of protests against his 30-year autocratic reign. A seven-year standoff ends as WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And on this World Parkinson's Day, creating awareness about the long-term degenerative disorder. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Well, a major regime change has taken place in Africa on Thursday. The longtime president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, was ousted by the military amid months of mounting demonstrations against his three decades of aggressive and strict rule. Pressure on the 75-year-old leader to step down increased this week as tens of thousands of protesters held a five-day sit-in outside army headquarters in Khartoum. Soldiers protected the crowd from riot police, signaling that the army was likely no longer supporting the president. We get more on the rise and fall of Omar al-Bashir in this report from Mia Wamasli. He ruled Sudan with an iron fist for 30 years. But on Thursday, the country's president was overthrown in a coup by the African nation's armed forces. They announced a two-year period of military rule, followed by elections. President Omar al-Bashir has faced months of protests and calls to step down. In a televised address, the country's defense minister said Bashir was under arrest in a safe place and that a military council was now running the country adding that there would be a three-month state of emergency, a nationwide ceasefire, and the suspension of the constitution. He also said Sudan's airspace would be closed for 24 hours and border crossings shut until further notice. Since Saturday, thousands of demonstrators have been camping out outside the defense ministry compound in Khartoum, which contains Bashir's residence. Clashes erupted on Tuesday between soldiers trying to protect the protesters and intelligence and security personnel trying to disperse them. At least 11 people died. <laughs> President Bashir, a former paratrooper, seized power in a bloodless coup in 1989. A divisive figure, he withstood attempts by the West to weaken him. In 1993, the U.S. added Bashir's government to its list of terrorism sponsors for harboring Islamist militants. Bashir has also been indicted by the International Criminal Court over allegations of genocide in Sudan's Darfur region during an insurgency that began in 2003. Persistent protests have rocked the country since December, sparked by the government's attempt to raise the price of bread and an economic crisis that has led to fuel and cash shortages. Opposition figures have been calling for the military to help negotiate an end to the president's nearly three decades in power and a transition to democracy. But the main organizer of last week's protests rejected the 24-month transition under a military council. The Sudanese Professionals Association called on protesters to carry on with the sit-in outside the country's defense ministry. Well, that was Reuters Mia Womersley with that report. Meanwhile, the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum is advising Americans in Sudan to avoid areas of demonstrations. Now, for one woman on a Khartoum street, this is a special night. Tonight is the night of celebration or a feast. Tonight, we are extremely happy. April 11th is the day of salvation. Now, reaction from Bashir's ouster has been swift, but mixed, uh, but rather mixed. Some demonstrators uh, uh, cheered the fall of the president, and, but are now condemning the military council said to replace him. The Sudan Professional Association, a key organizer of the recent protests, is rejecting the announcement that the Amilad Council will rule Sudan for the next two years. Joining me on the phone from Khartoum to further discuss the situation is journalist Naba Moedin. Good evening, Naba. Good evening, Vincent. Yes, now we have uh, kind of mentioned that. Tell us a bit more about the reaction of the people. There was jubilation, there's been celebration, but is that all that is on the streets of Khartoum? Uh, actually, the celebration in the, first, in the early morning, in the first hours, people were very excited about the announcement. Once the TV, the national TV and podcast announced that our army have a communicate to, to, to release. 
uh, then after the press, uh, after the committee was released uh, by our email, people right now are very angry about it, and they are insisted not to leave the army headquarters and to, to keep uh, protesting and uh, to be still in the city. Uh, they think that are, they are deceived also because our Dignity Office also uh, wanted by ICC and uh, he is Islamist. He has an Islamic background. So people right now are not, uh, are not happy about it at all. And they think that it's just um, a plan from, um, from Islamic movement to, to produce itself again. Well, uh, Bashir uh, is a military person. He's been surrounded by military people. What exactly did uh, the citizens of uh, Sudan expect would happen if uh, Bashir leaves the office? Uh, people in Sudan think that our Dignity is very loyal to Al Bashir. Uh, there is uh, another uh, officers are not lo uh, are not loyal to Al Bashir, so they can announce it and they can run the country for one year. But people generally refuse. The army transitional two years, they think it's too enough for them to have 30 years rule of a military rule. They, they, they are looking for a civil government from all parties and from all, uh, for, uh, from ch uh, power change and from SPA also, to the Ministry Professional Association. So they are not happy with military rule generally. So do we expect to see the protests continue, the sit-ins continue? Yes, uh, we expect, uh, I expect uh, the protests will continue, and we were in the headquarters minutes, minutes before. People were so angry and saying ch uh, chants and slogans saying that we will not go back till, till it's full again, and uh, we don't want you out of the north, and they, are, they were saying chants, and they, are, they were not happy at all. So people are insisting to, to, to be in the city right now. Has there been any um, reaction uh, locally on uh, national TV from uh, other sources other than the military's announcement? No, 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 not at all. Well, because previously most of the TV channels were owned by Islamic uh, personnel, personnel, mm -hmm. and um, it was it, it was just um, how to say it was the channels of uh, NCP. Okay. So right now yep. they they feel they are so beaten. Well, Naba, thank you very much. Uh, you've been doing a great job reporting on that story. As journalist Naba Mohideen reporting from Khartoum. Now, for more insight into what uh, Bashir's removal means for Sudan, I'm joined by Nimad Ahmadi, founder of the Darfur Women Action Group. Nimad, welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, first, uh, what was your immediate reaction when you saw this uh, development in Khartoum? Oh, well, uh, my immediate reaction, I actually cried. Um, and we, even though we cautiously, um, we are cautiously uh, optimistic, but I felt the sense of justice, and it gave me a sense that change is real. Yes, and given that uh, for a person like you, you've for many years been fighting for the rights uh, and uh, justice for people of, uh, of Darfur. But uh, people look, again, kind of uh, disappointed because the military has made this announcement and said it will rule for about two years. Nobody knows what happens after that. Now, here's the question. What did the demonstrators expect would happen when they were on the uh, streets? Well... The demonstrated de demanding no less than uh, an actual change. And I think the demand is le legitimate and just, and that is what we all want to see happen. Um, however, I see this as one step forward in the direction of many million steps that we need to, to see happen um, in our fight to achieve justice mm -hmm. um, in Sudan. And it is up to the Sudanese people to make it clear that we cannot be ruled by military um, again. And uh, to me, it would be very reasonable if uh, people demanded that uh, this um, um, military council can have between one to three months to give power to a multi um, the diverse group of uh, interim government that will lead the country through the process of an interim period, not two years, not one year, but at least like four to five years to get the country out of crisis. The people who have been impacted by conflict need to go home peacefully to their place of origin and voluntarily. 
um, demilitarizing the street and everywhere. So many militias that was created by this government mm -hmm. and establishing a new constitution whereby people can have a free and fair election. I don't see now, one year will be enough for people to have that. Now, election. some will tell you that the military can justify staying in power for up to two years in order to get all those things together, for example, to clear any uh, violent groups that may be having arms and also to build uh, the democratic institutions, uh, perhaps to write a new constitution. And they need the military because the government has been round, uh, uh, centered around the military. What would you say to those who uh, Well, like I don't think um, uh, we, uh, the military need to stay for two years because we don't need a military government. The civilian government can, can replace this military. We need the military to be independent. To st yes, of course we need military to to, 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 to control um, the, 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 uh, the security of the Sudan in itself. And it's obvious that uh, many of the military uh, and the generals are, um, they're hard as with the people, but also this is the same military that created the militias and created the myths. They cannot clear it. They cannot create a constitution that will serve the people of Sudan. We don't trust them anymore. That's exactly how al-Bashir came to power and said to people, be patient, give me two years, give me 10 years, give me, and all of a sudden now we are 30 years away and he has completely destroyed the country and the people. So now, do, we, do you see in Sudan a civilian, a group of civilians who would be ready to take the reins of power, say in three, four months from now? Of course I do see. Sudanese are not short of leadership. However, this regime has controlled uh, and then created this perception that the international community in particular has been always justified as like, well, what will happen to Sudan if Bashir? Bashir is the worst to rule the Sudan. And Sudan has so many uh, civilians who are qualified to lead the people. And it is not about who to lead, but w how people want to be led. Are there lessons that could be learned from countries where there have been regime change? You can talk about Egypt just up north. You can go to the other northern part of uh, the continent and talk about Tunisia. And uh, now we're seeing things in Algeria. Or even go down to Zimbabwe. Is, are there any lessons so, uh, Sudanese could learn from them? Yeah, there is a lot of lessons to be learned of um, either like replacing Ahmed with Haji Ahmed, as Sudanese always play, like just rebranding their face and come back with a different uh, face. That is very um, um, uh, like usual for the uh, Islamist group to do. But I think right now the awareness and the conscience that the Sudanese people have reach you to and they rise beyond the, their circumstances they are very aware that um, they need to safeguard this process of change they need to be vigilant and to to to, to articulate their demand and work together to make sure that we bring the change that Sud sudanese people wanted one well, thank you very much uh, for your insights we really greatly appreciate it's perspectives. My and thank you for that. Yes. Uh, well, that's uh, Niamat uh, Ahmadi. She's a founder of the DAFO Women Action. Now, the area in West Africa called the Sahel, that is Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mauritania, is a largely open region where tourism and insurgency have significantly expanded in recent years. VOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young examines the situation and the underlying causes of its growing instability. Africa's western Sahel, the region just below the Sahara Desert, is exploding with terrorism. A recent report from the Africa Center at the U.S. National Defense University says the number of violent Islamist group incidents in that weakly protected region has doubled each year since 2016. A number of military operations are responding. The G5 Sahel multinational force is there, as is France's Operation Barkhan. There is also the United Nations MINUSMA peacekeeping force in Mali and the U.S. Africa Command, which trains and supports local militaries. However, the Sahel is a largely open space where attackers are difficult to corner. 
co-author of the Africa Center report, Pauline LaRue. It is uh, hard to tell uh, exac exactly who has the upper hand and who hasn't. What is sure is that um, the militaries have been striving to counter the insurgencies that have been running. Mali's March 2012 military coup and subsequent instability provided Islamic extremists with a relatively unguarded place to grow. These groups have since spread to Burkina Faso and Niger. They battled both military forces as well as each other. Via Skype, Sufan Center's senior fellow Colin Clark. So it's really offshoots and splinter groups directly related to the two major terrorist organizations. And there's a battle for supremacy in this area where you have Al-Qaeda seeking to exert its dominance while the Islamic State uh, clings to territory in and around parts of uh, of Nigeria. So it's really uh, uh, quite an unstable situation and likely to get worse. It takes money to fund terrorist operations. And in the Western Sahel, traditional illicit activities now assist Islamic insurgency. Via Skype from the Netherlands, International Center for Counterterrorism analyst Lisbeth van der Heide. There's really only one game in town, and that's trafficking, and then trafficking of pretty much everything. I mean, narco trafficking is well known, uh, arms trafficking, human trafficking. Um, so basically anything you can traffic along the, the centuries-old trade routes um, in the region, it will be trafficked. And that's the main source of income of most of the terrorist rebel militant groups in the region. When military operations kill Western Sahel's militants, more fighters often emerge. Nations and international bodies can find and stop terrorist revenue sources, but new ones are developed. And there can be ideological support from the population because of underlying regional conditions. By a Skype from Abuja, the director of the research organization Center for Democracy and Development, Idiot Hassan. The main challenge is that of the root causes, which is uh, a feeling of exclusion, marginalization of the people and poverty rising poverty in the in the countries is exacerbated hassan joins many other analysts in saying that so long as the people of the sahel feel their governments do not give them a place at the economic table and a political voice that is responded to islamic extremists and other insurgents will have a fertile field of operation Jeffrey Young, VOA News, Washington. We're stand now for our health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Madu with the latest news on Parkinson's disease. Lino. April 11th marks World Parkinson's Day, which is being observed in order to raise awareness of the realities of living with the disorder. Parkinson's disease is a progressive nervous system disorder that affects a movement and its symptoms start gradually. Parkinson's disease occurs worldwide, but little is known about it in Africa. The disease is the second most common age-related neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease. An estimated 7 to 10 million people worldwide have Parkinson's disease. The rate of newly diagnosed cases generally increases with age. An estimated 4% of people with Parkinson's age are diagnosed before age 50. Medical experts say men are 1.5 times more likely to have Parkinson's than women. The disease affects a patient's quality of life and it marks a social interaction more difficult. As I mentioned, little is known about Parkinson's in Africa. Joining me now live via Skype from Accra, Ghana, is Dr. Augustina Charwe Feli, Secretary General of the African Academy of Neurology. Dr. Augustina, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Also joining us live via Skype from Accra is Jervis Aquadwo Jokoto, the founder of a Parkinson's disease support group in Ghana. Mr. Jokoto, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Dr. Augustina, let me start with you. At, as I mentioned earlier in the report, uh, Parkinson's is a little known in Africa. How much of a problem is it in sub-Saharan Africa? So um, I would like to clarify that it's not that much is not known about it. Uh, we do know about it. Um, we are not sure of the numbers, but from the little we've already seen, 
it seems to be as prevalent in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa as it is worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Jokoto, to you now, at what point were you diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and did you have any awareness of the condition prior? No, uh, I was diagnosed uh, uh, with the disease uh, 16 years ago, that's 2003, but uh, before then I knew very little about the disease. Uh, at least I knew that Mohammed Ali had it and, uh, has it. and uh, it was after I was diagnosed that uh, I, I, I managed to get a lot of information by reading and uh, uh, educating myself about the condition. Okay, education is uh, definitely important <laughs> according to what is being said. Dr. Augustina, it is a condition that progresses over time. And so what are the telltale signs that can indicate to someone to seek medical help? So usually the first sign would be um, shaking of more commonly the hands. Sometimes it can be of the head. And the shaking would be uh, when the limb of the hand is not being used. Um, others will note that they are getting slower in movement, they feel stiffer, sometimes with pain. Um, but if you speak to a lot of individuals, they'll tell you that they may have noticed problems long before that. So constipation is often a problem, a change in mood, the slowness of thinking, um, that may be the first telltale sign. And Mr. Jokoto, you were diagnosed 16 years ago. What has been the journey like in terms of uh, finding proper care and treatment? Yeah, um, you know, we, we've, we've had some difficulties with uh, availability of medications and uh, the cost. Uh, that has uh, been a problem most of the time and uh, people would rather seek other means of therapy than going to see the regular neurologist to, 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 to treat them. And uh, that has been a problem, availability and cost of medication. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Mm -hmm. Augustina, where do you see the needs then, especially as a medical professional? So um, one of the reasons why today's um, commemoration, World Parkinson's Day, is so important is that it raises awareness on all levels with all stakeholders. So it's important for the general public to be able to recognize that healthy aging does not include the signs that an individual with Parkinson's disease has. And if they do develop those um, signs, they should seek medical attention. Um, on other levels, so raising awareness amongst our healthcare practitioners, the primary care especially, to be able to recognize these individuals in their communities and address the issues and uh, refer them further if those issues are not easily um, controlled. And then the final, the most important stakeholder, our governments, our healthcare policy makers, um, needs to be um, more involved in understanding that this is a real problem, it does exist, um, we are no different from anywhere else in the world, and that um, policies need to be implemented so that there is availability of care, there's availability of medications, mm -hmm. and that no matter your geographical location, no matter your economic status, you should still have access to appropriate care, again, almost irrespective of what disease you have, but especially if it's Parkinson's disease. So, Mr. Jokoto, as someone who is living with the condition, what message uh, from your experience would you like to share with uh, uh, people who are watching the program, whether it's in Ghana specifically or uh, Africa as a whole? Yeah, uh, Parkinson's disease is real, and um, uh, it, it, it can affect anybody. And um, um, I think that uh, it's very important for us to develop a very positive attitude if you, 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 you are affected by it. And um, um, that is the more reason why this uh, support group was set up so that 
people living with the condition can uh, have a way of uh, uh, sharing, educating themselves, and uh, supporting each other, and encouraging one another. And um, uh, I think that when we do that, that will go a very long way, at least in giving you uh, the ability uh, to uh, withstand uh, some of the challenges that come along. Okay, Mr. Jokoto, we wish you all the best. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Augustina, we appreciate your time. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. And Dr. Augustina Chawe Feli is Secretary General of um, the African Academy of Neurology. And Gervais uh, Quadro Jokoto is living with Parkinson's disease and the founder of the Parkinson Support Group in Ghana. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Vincent, back to you. Well, thanks a lot, Lino. Uh, now, I want to be sure to watch Lino Madu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Now, the United States on Thursday charged WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in a computer hacking conspiracy linked to the release of hundreds of thousands of secret uh, U.S. documents just hours after British police dramatically arrested him at the Ecuadorian embassy in London after he sought asylum for years. Matthew Lorotonda has a story. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, has been arrested after his years-long refuge in Ecuador's London embassy, and the United States is pressing for extradition. British police say they were allowed into the embassy to make the arrest after Ecuador's government withdrew Assange's asylum status. WikiLeaks says Ecuador did this in violation of international law. Assange had been holed up in the embassy since 2012 to avoid extradition to Sweden over a sexual assault investigation. Sweden later dropped the case, but he remained in the embassy over fears that the United States wants to prosecute him over WikiLeaks's role in the release of hundreds of thousands of secret government documents over the years, many embarrassing. Most notably, the trove of diplomatic communications in 2010 that laid bare behind-the-scenes workings on everything from the Iraq war to relations with Russia, and that same year, a classified video that showed the killing of a dozen civilians in Iraq by an American attack helicopter, including two Reuters journalists. Assange's relationship with his protectors at the embassy has soured in recent months, and Ecuador accused him of leaking material about their president Moreno's private life. On Wednesday, WikiLeaks also claimed that the Ecuador authorities were spying on Assange and that an unidentified group in Spain was trying to extort money from him after they obtained his medical records and other private documents. It's not immediately clear if the two incidents are related to his arrest. Well, that was Reuters' Matthew Laura Tunda reporting. Have a good night.